Can an element play hide and seek? It sounds like a riddle, but in the case of Lanthanum, the element that you chose in Paul, the answer is surprisingly yes. Today we're going to uncover Lanthanum's story, from its sneaky discovery and quirky name, to the unique properties and the many ways that this rare earth metal quietly improves our modern day lives. Welcome to Cube Chemistry, where we will discuss all the elements of the periodic system and also do experiments. And if you like this video and want to see more, make sure to like and subscribe. Also make sure to fill in the poll so you can influence next week's experiment. And if you want a chemistry question every week and you want to influence the elements that actually get in the public poll, consider becoming a member. Now what we have here again is a member of the silvery grey squad of elements. But since every element by itself is of course special, this particular one started a movement of its own. In this cube we can see a dark but silvery grey chunks that seems to be a little bit brittle. Now this element is lanthanum, and lanthanum marks the start of the lanthanides, or as we hear about them in the news, the rare earth metals. Now, as always, if you want a piece of lanthanum yourself, on your shelf, click on the link in the description, use the promo code, and you will be helping out our channel. Now, our story begins in the early 19th century. Chemists across Europe were hunting for new elements, especially in strange minerals called rare earths. Now, one of these chemists was Carl Gustav Mosander. Yes, the same guy from last week's Erbium. A Swedish chemist and a true element detective. In 1839, Mosander was studying what everybody thought was pure cerium oxide. Cerium being an element discovered a few decades earlier. Now, you can think of this cerium oxide like a supposedly a pure batch of cookies. Mosander suspected there might be an extra ingredient hiding in the mix. And he was right. He noticed that part of his cerium compound would dissolve in acid, while another part wouldn't. Hinting that something new was present. By carefully peeling back the cerium, Mosander uncovered a completely new element hidden within. He named this secret stowaway lanthanum, the hidden one. It's as if lanthanum have been playing hide and seek with chemists and Mosander finally found it. Now, Mosander's discovery was of course initially met with curiosity. After all, finding a new element inside another one was very unexpected. Like discovering a surprise toy inside a chocolate egg. In fact, lanthanum wasn't alone. Mosander suspected even more elements were lurking inside that cerium mixture. He later announced another element from it, which he called didinium, Greek for twin. Little did he know that twin was actually a pair of different elements, brassiodinium and neodymium, in disguise. But that's another story. What matters is that lanthanum was the first of many hidden elements, the rare earth elements, to be isolated. And its discovery opened the floodgates for chemists to find others. Interestingly, a student named Axel Erdmann independently also found lanthanum in a mineral that same year confirming that this hidden element was real and ready to come out of the shadows. So why was lanthanum hiding for so long? Well, the answer lies in chemistry. Lanthanum was locked away in minerals alongside other look-alike elements. These rare earth elements are chemically so similar to each other that separating them is really tricky. Imagine a group of nearly identical siblings all pretending to be one another. In Mosander's time, separating one rare earth metal from another was like solving a particularly tough puzzle. Now, in fact, isolating pure lanthanum metal proved to be even harder. Chemists didn't manage to obtain pure metallic lanthanum until 1923, decades after Mosander first found the oxide. It was truly a game of patience and skill to coax lanthanum out into the open. Now, this story is very similar to the erbium story we talked about last week. The name lanthanum comes from the Greek lanthanine, meaning to lie hidden. It's an eponym, namesake, of the lanthanide series, a whole family of elements numbered 57 to 71 on the periodic table, and they are called the lanthanides after lanthanum, because lanthanum was the first of this hidden family to be discovered. And speaking of the periodic table, have you ever noticed that the lanthanides and their cousins, the actinides, are often pulled out and placed at the bottom of the table? So what's lanthanum like when it's not hiding in ore? Well, if you would held a piece of lanthanum metal in your hand, like for instance from this cube, you would see a silvery white metallic luster. 
at least initially. Freshly cut lantanum is shiny like silver. Now it's also notably soft. So soft that you can cut it with a knife with a bit of effort. In fact, lantanum's softness is about on par with lead. It's nowhere near as hard as steel. This softness means that it's quite malleable, easy to pound or bend, and ductile. You could draw it into a thin wire. But don't expect that shiny silver surface to last long in air. The reason for this is that lantanum tarnishes quickly when exposed to oxygen. It's a lot like how an apple slice turns brown when exposed, or how old silver coin darkens over time. Except lantanum does it even faster. Leave lantanum out and it will rapidly develop a dull coating of oxide. The metal reacting with oxygen. In other words, lantanum metal doesn't like stay naked in air, it reacts and hides under an oxide layer almost immediately. Now lantanum is also a quite reactive element. How reactive you may wonder? Well, if you toss a piece of lantanum into water, not that we recommend doing this at home, it will react with the water to produce lantanum hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Now the behavior is a little bit similar to what calcium and alkaline metal does in water. Which is interesting because lantanum sits right next to calcium's heavier cousin, barium, on the periodic table. And if you heat lantanum or have it in powder form, it burns easily when ignited, giving a bright flame. So, while lantanum isn't famously reactive, as the likes of sodium or potassium, it is definitely an active metal. It wants to combine with other elements, oxygen, water, acids, you name it. Now in chemistry terms, lantanum commonly forms a plus 3 oxidation state, meaning it typically loses 3 electrons and forms trivalent ions in compounds. It can occasionally form plus 2 in some special compounds, but plus 3 is its comfort zone. By losing those electrons, it achieves a stable electron configuration, which is why it reacts so readily. You could say that lantanum is a generous element. It readily gives away its electrons to bond with others. Now, like many of the other rare earth elements, lantanum is not actually that rare. This is a fun twist. The term rare earth is a bit of a historical misnomer. Lantanum is the 28th most abundant element in the earth's crust. Actually, almost three times more common than lead in terms of abundance. Now, many people are very surprised because of this, because the word rare makes it sound extremely scarce. In reality, elements like lantanum and its rare earth cousins like cerium and neodymium are fairly plentiful in the ground. There is more lantanum out there than there is even silver or mercury or lead. The catch is that rare earths are rarely found in concentrated, economically exploitable forms. Now, they're usually scattered in small amounts within certain minerals, all lumped together. So while there is a lot of lantanum to go around, it's hidden among other elements in ores and requires a considerable amount of effort to extract it. Now, chemists and mining companies have to perform elaborate chemical separations to tease out the lantanum from ores like monazite or bastana azite, which are major sources of this element. These minerals can contain a significant fraction of lantanum. Monazite might be up to 25% lantanum oxide, bastana azite up to 38% lantanum. But separating lantanum from the other rare earths in those minerals is challenging. This difficulty is exactly what kept lantanum and its neighbors hidden from the early scientists for so long. Lantanum's place in the periodic table is also noteworthy. It sits in period 6 in the series of elements that we usually show below the main table. Lantanum is the first of the lanthanides. In fact, the whole series is named after it. These lanthanides, La through Lu, are sometimes called the Rare Earth series. They're all metals with broadly similar chemistry, which is why, as mentioned, they tend to occur together in nature. Now, lantanum itself has an electron configuration that spares it any 4f electrons in the neutral atom. Meaning, it actually doesn't have electrons in the f orbitals like its successors do. Without getting too technical, this makes lantanum only weakly paramagnetic, weakly attracted to a magnetic field. Unlike some later lanthanides, which are more strongly magnetic. But for general audience, the key point is that lantanum is the prototype of a whole family of elements and kind of sets the stage for rare earth metals. 
It is a magnetic solid at room temperature, melting at 920 degrees Celsius, way above the heat of a normal household oven, and it has a high boiling point over 3400 degrees Celsius. Now it is also a fairly dense metal, about 6.15 grams per cubic centimeter, roughly half as dense as iron. And while lantanum has no biological role in our bodies, we don't need it to live, and it is also moderately toxic in large amounts. It turns out to be incredibly useful in technology and industry. Now, first of all, Lantanum is a team player in modern rechargeable batteries. If you drive a hybrid car or you have used certain rechargeable batteries, you've benefited from Lantanum. Now, one of the major uses of Lantanum is in nickel metal hydride batteries, the type famously used in early Toyota Prius hybrid cars and many other hybrid vehicles. The battery in a Prius, for example, contains a substantial amount of lantanum, roughly 10 kilograms of lantanum per car battery pack on average. That's right, the green car in your driveway might have about 22 pounds of lantanum hiding in the battery, helping store energy. Lantanum is used in the battery's negative electrode in the form of lantanum nickel hydride alloy. This special alloy can absorb and release hydrogen ions during charging and discharging. In essence, lantanum acts like a sponge for hydrogen inside a battery. Lantanum's talent for hiding hydrogen doesn't stop at batteries. Scientists have also used lantanum in alloys to store hydrogen gas for hydrogen power vehicles. A lantanum nickel alloy can soak up hydrogen gas, then release it when needed, almost like a fuel tank on a molecular level. It's one avenue being explored for hydrogen fuel economy. Imagine a solid chunk of metal acting as a safe hydrogen tank. Lantanum makes that possible by forming stable metal hydrides. While pure lantanum itself isn't used for much, it's usually too reactive and soft to be structural, in alloy form it becomes extremely useful. Now, in fact, lantanum metal itself has no major commercial uses. It's mostly used when combined with other elements. But as part of an alloy or compound, lantanum is invaluable. Now, we also use it in optics and glass, places where lantanum helps us see better, literally. High-end camera lenses, binoculars, and even telescopes, optics, often owe their clarity to lantanum. Lantanum 3 oxide, LA. 203 is added to special optical glass to improve its properties. Glass with lantanum oxide can have a high refractive index and low dispersion. Now, in plain language, that means that the glass can bend light more effectively without spreading out the colors as much. The result sharper images and less chromatic aberration. Those annoying color fringes you sometimes see in photos through cheap lenses. So if you ever admired a crystal clear photograph or gazed at the stars through a quality telescope, lantana might have been the secret ingredient in the lens, making the view so crisp. Even some eyeglasses use lantanum containing glass for thinner, high index lenses. It is also used in night vision goggles. The glass in night vision devices often contains lantanum to help absorb infrared light, which is what night vision amplifies. Essentially, lantanum helps those goggles capture light in the dark more effectively, which is critical for military, security or wildlife applications where seeing in near darkness is necessary. Now, lantanum even shines in the lighting industry, quite literally. Before modern LED and fluorescent lights, one of the ways that we lit up movie projectors and studio lights was with carbon arc lamps. A very bright type of lamp used in old projectors and searchlights. These lamps involve an electric arc jumping between carbon rods. It turns out that if you add some lantanum or other rare earth compounds to the carbon electrodes, you get a brighter arc that more closely mimics sunlight. Lantanum in those old cinema projectors helped produce a clean white light that made films look great on the big screen. So next time you watch a classic film from Hollywood golden age, know that Lantana might have had the hand in lighting up those images on the screen. Lantana is also the sparker that we see in cigarette lighters. You know that cigarette lighter or barbecue lighter that makes a spark when you flick the wheel? Now that spark comes from a special alloy called Mischmetall. 
which is used as a flint. Mishmetal is a mix of rare earth metals and about 20% of it is lantanum. When you scrape the lighter, tiny particles of this rare earth alloy peel off and ignite the air, creating sparks. Lantanum's presence in the alloy helps to produce a good hot spark by contributing to the alloy's softness and pyrophoric, easy to sparking, nature. Now beyond gadgets and gizmos, lantanum also plays a role in heavy industry and energy. A major use of lantanum is as a catalyst in oil refineries. Specifically, lantanum is used in fluid catalytic cracking, catalysts that help break down crude oil into gasoline and other useful fuels. In these catalysts, lantanum oxide is incorporated into zeolite, a kind of porous material. The lantanum stabilized catalyst is great at cracking the large hydrocarbon molecules in petroleum into smaller ones like the ones in gasoline. Metallurgists sometimes add a pinch of lantanum to certain metal alloys. For example, adding a small amount of lantanum can help make a nodular cast iron by influencing how graphite forms in the iron. Lantanum is also used in some high quality steels to improve their properties. Last but not least, lantanum has found its role into medicine. It turns out that one of lantanum's compounds is very useful for people with a certain medical condition. Lantanum carbonate, a salt of lantanum, is used as a medication for patients with kidney failure. When kidneys fail, they can't remove the excess phosphate from the blood, leading to dangerous levels of phosphate in the body. Lantanum carbonate, taken as a chewable tablet, acts as a phosphate binder. When it reaches the digestive tract, it binds to phosphate from food and prevents from being absorbed, thereby lowering the phosphate levels in the blood. Now, for those who are concerned, lantanum in this form doesn't significantly poison the body. It stays mostly in the gut binding phosphate. Lantanum's toxicity is considered moderate, but in the controlled doses as a medicine, it is safe and effective. Aside from this, lantanum isn't something you need in your diet. And you won't find it in your multivitamins, trust me. Now, Lantana may not be the household name, but it is a classic example of an unsung hero, quietly enabling the technology and comforts we rely on, all while staying largely behind the scenes. So remember that story earlier in the video about Didymium, the element that was actually two other elements? Take a look at this video about Neodymium and you can hear that story. And if you like this video, Make sure to like and hit the subscribe button and comment if you think I forgot something.